Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for this special blessing to be here in your house today. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here today. Father, we thank you for what you're already doing in this place. Father, we do thank you that the tomb is empty. Lord, we have cause to celebrate today. Father, we thank you that it's paid in full. Father, I thank you that when Jesus did what he did, that it was finished. Lord, we just give you this time now, in Jesus' name, amen. So when I pulled these out earlier, uh, folks looked at me, those who knew what these were looked at me like I was maybe a little crazy. If you've never seen these, these are called childproof because I can't get them out. These are called the, the resurrection eggs. And I had the blessing the other day during our Easter egg hunt to uh, have a couple of the kids come up here and, and help me tell the story of, of Jesus and to, to talk about his sacrifice on the cross. All the different things uh, that would go along with the, the gospel. When I do this, I call uh, a couple of the children up front, and I don't remember what color the one I'm uh, looking for is, is in. But there's one hidden in there. Uh, when I called the kids up, I let them, they pick them up in order and they show what's in there. There was one in there that it has a rooster and it's always an awesome time with the kids because they pulled that rooster out and said, ooh, look, a kitty. And I looked and I was like, man, how'd a cat get in there? And it was the rooster he was holding up and then another kid explained to us that that wasn't, that wasn't no kitty, that's a rooster. But that's a, that's a tough story to share with children. Because see, also hidden in here is, is a whip. I have to explain to those children that there were people who didn't like Jesus. People who wanted to beat Jesus, and he was beaten. The money that you saw just then, I had to, to tell them there were people who pretended to be Jesus' friend, but they, they betrayed him and turned their back on him for, for money. It's a tough story to tell the children. There's even one with the, the crown of thorns. As I tell that story, I can always see that, that some of them are listening and there's a little bit of uh, maybe sadness in their face because folks, children who know Jesus, they love Jesus. And to hear a story, the story of his death, to hear of him being mistreated, it hurts them. But I'm gonna tell you what, they get pretty excited when we get to this one, amen? This one's empty. This one represents the tomb of Jesus. They get excited when we get this, and I tell you, I never really know how much they really comprehend and how much they take in, but if you're here today and, and you teach children or have anything to do with that, you understand they take in a lot more than we realize, amen? They're a whole lot smarter, and as a side note, parents, that means they're watching you and learning from you too, but that's a free one there. We went and we finished that up, and they, like I say, they, they get excited. Some are excited because it's time to go out and, and hunt the Easter eggs. We went out, and they had thousands of eggs. Man, they were everywhere out there. They're running everywhere. And one young man comes running up to, to one of the, the leaders and, and, and tells her that he had found one with nothing in it. He found an empty one. Well, of course, the, the leader immediately felt bad that, man, I guess we, we missed one. And had to be explained that he didn't, he didn't want any candy in that egg. He was excited because he had found the one that was empty, just like the tomb of Jesus. I stood back and I watched this and I thought, man, how awesome. That little boy, I think he's five years old. He was listening. He was excited. And when he left, he walked out. And I want to tell you, y'all, I know that the pastor's weird and you have to talk to him. He stands by the door when you go out, and, and some of you make your kids talk to me when they come out. This young man, he walked up. Nobody had to tell him. He had that empty egg in his hand. And he was so proud to tell me that he had found the egg 
that was like the tomb of Jesus. He was excited about that. So I ask you this morning, when you got up at your house this morning and, and realized it was Easter, you started getting ready for church, was your excitement anything like the excitement of that child? When you think about even now and you're here at church, you're gathered with a body of believers to, to worship Jesus, to recount the story of Christ, do you have excitement? Church, I'm telling you that that empty tomb is the whole reason why we're here. That empty tomb is the whole reason why we can walk around with joy in our heart and a smile on our face because Jesus is alive. That empty tomb is the whole reason those folks that stood up here a while ago with those pieces of cardboard with things written on them, that empty tomb is the reason why we know all that stuff is true. I pray today that if you don't have excitement about that, that you do before you leave here today. I pray that God puts something anew in your heart. I pray that if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that you understand how important that empty tomb is. Today we're going to, to look at God's word in, in Matthew chapter 28, and, and we're going to look at the things that, that happen when they go and, and discover the, the tomb is empty. And this is the time that after Jesus has been crucified on the cross, Jesus has, has given his life for us, and now in a borrowed tomb, he's been laid to rest. You know, we, know, we know that those who would oppose Jesus, those who were against him, were afraid that, that Jesus might do what he had said because he said on the third day he would rise again. So they made sure that that, that couldn't happen. They actually sent soldiers to guard the tomb of Jesus, to guard the tomb of a, of, of a deceased person that they had killed. They sent soldiers there, and they put a big stone in front of it. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 66, so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing with stone and setting the guard. It kind of sets the tone with, with where we are now If as we begin in, in Matthew 28. We're going to read verses 1 through 10 there. It says, now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took a hold of his feet and worshiped him. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Hearing that this morning, I pray that that puts joy in your heart. I pray it brings a little excitement to you this morning to realize that Jesus is alive. That Satan and this world thought they could kill him, but they couldn't. There's not been a, a, a tomb or a grave made yet that could hold Jesus. There is something we get very, something that we get that's very important out of that. And we hear that story. What do we have after that? We have a, a crucified Christ who, who went in, who was carried into that tomb. But coming out of that, we have a resurrected Jesus. And folks, I'm telling you this morning that a resurrected Jesus is what makes Christianity all the different. 
the rest of the, the, the man-made religions of the world, if you go and look for their leaders, there's a tomb to visit that has a, a decayed body in there. Now you can go and you can, you can see some places where they believe might be the tomb of Jesus, but if you go look in there and we're going to see, it was it's the same way a long time ago. It's empty. And praise God that it's empty. That gives us our hope. That gives us what we need to deal with every day. As a matter of fact, this, this resurrected Jesus gives us a few things that I want to share with you this morning. The first one, the resurrected Jesus gives us power over all fear. A resurrected Jesus gives us power over all fear. And at the tomb that morning, there were, there were two different types of people. There were those who believed that Jesus was the Son of God and those who didn't. Those who didn't would be the, the Roman soldiers. We see what happened to them in verse 4. It said the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. They passed out. And then there were those who believed that Jesus was the Son of God. In verse 5, it said, And the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Folks, I believe that that is God's message for us today. God says, Do not be afraid. I know most folks in here, but I don't know everybody's story. I don't know what's going on in your, in your heart and in your head, but I know the world that we live in, and I know this world can be scary sometimes. I know the things, the challenges that we face, sometimes even in our homes, in our workplace, in our school, in our family, it can be scary things. God says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I believe in this place this morning that, that we too also have those two crowds. I believe that, that maybe there may be some here today that maybe you're not sure what you believe. Maybe you've never truly said yes to, to Jesus and made him Lord of your life. Well, I, I pray today that the Spirit of God speaks to you. I pray that, that through the, the sharing of his word today and as we've sung that your heart's been prepared and that, that, that you give God the opportunity and that you'll respond to the gospel of Jesus today. I believe there are probably those here today also who, like these ladies, are, are believers. God says to you, don't be afraid. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, don't be afraid. Psalm 118.6 says, The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. You know, as a a minister, I've had the opportunity uh, several times through the years to be with people and to minister to them and to talk and to pray with people that are in some, some pretty scary times. Probably the, the scariest of times I think that I've ever been with someone in is people who are facing death. Sometimes it's people who maybe have, have been in some type of traumatic accident and, and death is imminent, and, or maybe it's those who've been diagnosed with, with, with some type of, of disease that's going to take their life. I believe it was mentioned earlier, though, to remember we all have an appointment with death one day. But I can tell you that there is a difference in folks facing death in those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and those who have not. I have been with some that have actually gone to be with the Lord only, only moments after making Jesus Lord of their life. Praise God they had those, those opportunities. I praise God today that if you're here today and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, I'm not asking have you walked an aisle, I'm asking have you truly made Jesus Lord of your life? Have you accepted what he did on the cross? If you haven't done that, I pray you realize God's given you a chance today. God's given you a chance to, to accept the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. I pray you won't leave this place today without doing so. Life is scary. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. You know, when we walk around and, and we're fearful, you know, that's sin. For a Christian, for a person who says Jesus is, is Lord of their life, 
who believes that, that Jesus died on the cross and he, and he rose from the grave, you believe all that, but then we walk around in fear. Church, that's sin. That's a lack of faith. Jesus said he would never leave us. God's word says for us not to fear. So this morning, I pray if you're here and you're a child of God today and there's something going on in, in your life, whatever it is, every one of us, our situations are different, that you just give it to God today. You ask him to take that from you. And that you give him that, you ask him to give you that peace that passes all understanding that comes only through a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've been away from God for some time. Maybe you've been living for the world. Maybe there was a time where you knew no fear and now you realize you've swayed. I pray that today that you would come back, that you would understand that God is standing there with his arms wide open and he welcomes you back. Psalm 27, one says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Folks, God says, do not be afraid. A resurrected Jesus removes all fear. Revelation 1.17, we see a resurrected Jesus say, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. The resurrected Jesus gives us power over all fear. This morning, we also see that the resurrected Jesus, knowing that that tomb was empty, also lets us know and confirms for us that Jesus, just as he said he was, Jesus truly is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the, the truth, and, and we see there in verse 6, it said, just as he said. Just as he said, Jesus said that he would rise from the grave. And he did it. The truth is that the tomb was empty. It's still empty today. You know, when we get out of here and Satan gets on our back or, or he begins to, to question us or, or cause us to, to question things or he wants to convict you and, and acts like what Jesus did wasn't good enough or that, uh, or that you're not good enough, understand that the tomb's still empty. Jesus is alive. Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Matthew 17, 22 and 23, and while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and will be raised up on the third day and they were deeply grieved. And they were grieved because they were missing that last part. And you know, sometimes as, as the church, we walk around like them. We walk around grieved. We look at all the, the bad things of the world. And I want to tell you, I know it probably does break God's heart to see this world and to see us. But folks, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive this morning. The tomb is empty. That ought to give us something to, to be excited about. We ought not be, be grieved anymore because what Jesus did was enough. It is finished. It's done. Again, Matthew 20, 18 and 19, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and he will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and discourage and crucify him. And on the third day, He'll be raised up. Jesus is the truth this morning. And folks, to totally understand the, the relevance and the truth of the empty tomb, we have to back up just a little bit. And understand that Jesus shared the truth even before he rose from the grave. In Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, this is Jesus speaking, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This morning, I pray that you realize what the truth is. That all this stuff that we read, all this stuff that you hear, all the stuff that's in here, it's the truth. This is God's word. 
Jesus is the truth. And the truth is that Jesus really is God's son. And he really came and, and, and took up on the form of a man. He was 100% man, yet 100% God. He dwelt among men. He walked just like you and I. He was tempted just like you and I, yet he never sinned. He was not guilty of anything. His, his slate was, was clean. But he loved us enough. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, while we we're off doing our own thing, living for the world, turned our backs on God, Jesus came and gave himself for us. The truth is Jesus did die on the cross like he said. Jesus was beaten like he said. He died a horrible death. Way more horrible than just the, the thoughts of him being beat and him being nailed up on that cross and the suffering that he went through. But imagine the suffering that he went through being completely innocent. He did that this morning for you. For every single one of us, Jesus did that. There is nothing you can do to, to earn it. There's nothing too bad you can be to get it or not get it. This morning, God's got you here for a reason. God says to you, don't be afraid. God says to you that Jesus is the truth, and the truth is that one day death is going to come. The truth is that one day, if you don't make Jesus Lord of your life, that one day you're going to remember the opportunities. One day you'll remember today, and you'll wish that you'd taken advantage of that opportunity. I had the opportunity just a couple of years ago to lead a, a dear friend to the Lord who was lying in intensive care. He had been telling everyone that he knew Jesus. He was saved. He was battling cancer. He was well known in our community. As a matter of fact, he was a police officer. I praise God for that terrible disease that, that took his life. Because rather than being out here and maybe being killed in the line of duty or, or having an accident, or you know what, maybe making it to old age and not realizing how, <coughs> how real death was. This terrible disease that, that Satan meant for bad that came across in all his sickness, just a few hours before he died, he had someone call and, and ask me to come to the hospital and talk with him. And I went and talked with him and, and God and, and Jesus was right there in that room. And he prayed right there. And he made Jesus Lord of his life. And one of the ways that I know that it was real and it wasn't just something that he did because he was afraid is because after he did it, he said, when you do my funeral, you tell people that I got saved. You tell people they need to get saved. You tell them that Jesus is the truth. Church this morning, I pray this morning that you know Jesus. And if you do, I pray that, that you're excited about that empty tomb. And I pray that you're excited enough to, to go out and to tell others about it. There are hurting people all around us every day that, that need Jesus. And this morning, I, I pray that you know that, that Jesus loves you. He loves them. He loves us all. This morning, we have reason to celebrate a resurrected Jesus. We celebrate because, again, there is, there is no grave that can hold Jesus down. In verse 2, it said, And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. I pray this morning that as you hear that, that you understand that it wasn't that God sent an angel to move that stone so Jesus could get out. Jesus was already gone. Jesus was already alive. That stone was rolled away so that mankind might see inside and know that Jesus was alive, that he was not there. That first Easter morning, they went in and they saw exactly what Jesus said they would see. They saw an empty tomb. The death clothes were, were laying there and laying inside. They couldn't hold Jesus down. He was alive. This morning, I pray that you'll take a, a, a peek inside and, and see what they saw and understand that Jesus wasn't there and he's not there today. As a matter of fact, Jesus was alive and just as the angel told these ladies, he saw them, he saw others, he saw men on the road to Emmaus, he saw, he gathered with the disciples. As a matter of fact, hundreds of people saw Jesus before he ascended back into heaven. 
and he's just as alive today as he was then. So church, if we're walking around in fear, if we're walking around in afraid, if we're walking around beaten down because the world's got dark, that's not how God intended it. I said for us to walk around and, and, and know the peace that comes with Jesus Christ. I said, do not be afraid. In Romans 6, 9, and 10, death no longer is master over him for the death that he died. He died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. This morning, I'm excited about that empty tomb. I'm excited that just as he said, he rose from the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, again, just as he said, For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This morning, maybe you'll walk in the tomb with John as he goes in and sees the, the empty tomb. John 20, 5 through 7 says, And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in, and so Simon Peter also came, following him, and entered the tomb and saw the linen wrappings laying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Folks, it was finished. Jesus had done everything to that point that he said he was going to do. The tomb was empty. This morning, again, we have reason for excitement. We have reason to live with, with joy. We have something to share with folks, something that's real. The truth is that Jesus is alive. When Jesus said, I'll rise again, he did it. When Jesus said, it's finished, when he was there on that cross, it was finished. Everything that needed to be done for you to have a relationship with the Father was done by Jesus right there on that cross. And he confirmed who he was and his ability to do so when he rose from that grave. Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me shall live and won't die. Praise God, that's the truth. This morning, I pray that you believe in Jesus. I pray that you believe in the empty tomb. I pray that you, you have a peace beyond all understanding in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Lastly, I want you to see that the, the resurrected Jesus is worthy of our worship. The resurrected Jesus is worthy of our worship. And we talked about worship recently. We talked about the, the different ways that we might worship Christ. One of those is, is being right in here when we, when we sing and, and actually singing and participating. And, and maybe you weren't here, but I talked about, I know I have a, a terrible voice. I want to tell you that I've gotten a phobia. I'm afraid Mr. Tom wears headphones up there when I'm singing. And I know they have my mic where it's not coming. I'm afraid sometimes that Mr. Tom, so he can hear me now. I'm afraid that Mr. Tom can hear me when I'm singing. That's how bad my singing is. But you know what? It's a joyful noise to my heavenly father and when you sing it's a joyful noise to God we should worship God Jesus is worthy to be praised this morning understand there's more than than just singing in the church to to worship Jesus in verse 9 it said and behold Jesus met them and greeted them and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him you know, the word worship has a, a couple different meanings, and, and, and part of that is uh, some of the, the original text says that that word is like to, to kiss towards. And I don't know if you've, you've ever heard Cliff Freeman pray, but often when, when Cliff prays he, in his prayer, he, he says that we, we, we kiss towards you. So we would kiss towards someone that we truly love. It says that they got down at his feet and they worshiped him. This morning, church, Jesus is worthy to be praised. He's worthy of our worship. I pray that God puts something new on your heart that you understand truly what, what worship is. It says in the 11 disciples that went away into Galilee to the mountain when Jesus had appointed for them, which Jesus had appointed for them, when they saw him, they worshiped him. Church, when you come into the, to the midst of Jesus, do you, do you worship him? He's worthy of it. He deserves our worship. And when I say worship, I mean not just singing, but in the life that you live, in the way that you love others, in the way that you treat others, your witness. 
living a life that glorifies him is another way for you to, to worship Jesus. I pray this morning that on every opportunity, every time you get the chance, that, that you're willing to, to worship a resurrected Jesus. I go on and we go on and we see there in, in verse 7 it says that to go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold he was going ahead of you into Galilee then you will see him. Behold I have told you. And then how did they respond in verse 8? It says and they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report to the disciples. They quickly did exactly what they were told. They were obedient. I wonder this morning, is, is your life one that reflects obedience to Christ? Does your life reflect obedience to, to God and his word? In verse 9 it says, and they went to tell his disciples, Jesus showed up. Folks, when we're obedient and living for the Lord and living a life that glorifies him, Jesus is in our midst. He's always there. This morning, I wonder about your life. Are you living a life that's in accordance to this? Are you doing the things that, that God says to do in his word? It says, if you love me, in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John, 1 John 1, 5, whoever keeps his word, truly, they... Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought also to walk just as he walked. Maybe you look around. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian. And you look around and say, you know, I want more of Jesus in my life. I want to experience more. I want to feel his presence more. I want to be used by him more. Folks, he's there. He's just waiting for you to let him lead. He wants you to, to live that life that is in accordance with his word. He wants you to stop living that life that's in accordance with the world. You don't even have to nod your head because I know today that every one of us has heard in the world, everything's okay. There is no right and, and no wrong in our world today. So do what you want to do. Just be happy. Folks, sin is sin. And if you don't want to know what sin is, get into God's word. And if you get into God's word, you know what? We're all going to find out we got some places we need to clean up. And when we get in there and we, we have this stuff revealed to us and we want to clean it up, we can't fix it on our own, but we give it to God and God will take it away. And God will use you and God will start a, a, even a new work in you when we turn from sin when we repent and, and we confess it to him and ask for forgiveness. What if just in this small group this morning, this right here, there are sister churches all over the world, and I pray God is moving there, but I pray right now for this group that God would move in, in such a mighty way this morning that we would all say, God, I know that you put this and this and this on my heart this morning. God, I know that sin. God, I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed of that, but God, I know that you love me. God, I know that I'm just like the rest because you said there's none righteous, no, not one. God, I give that stuff from you. God, I want to turn from it. God, forgive me for that this morning. God, make me new. Start a new work in me this morning. What if we did that and we began to live that life where, where we just walk into a room? Y'all have heard of me talk about Brother Bobby Waddell. Brother Bobby walks into a room. He's not perfect. What makes Bobby different? Jesus. Bobby walks into a room and you just sense Jesus in the room. Amen. Some of y'all know Bobby. Bobby walks in and Jesus is right there with him. He's just a man. He's just like the rest of us. You know what? When folks walk into New Day Fellowship, they ought to say, man, Jesus was in that place. He's what, that's right, he's what makes a difference. This morning I pray if God is putting something on your heart that you'll confess it, that you'll repent from it, and you'll turn to God. You want more of God, he wants more of you this morning. So they came and held him by the feet, and they worshiped him. They worshiped him. Folks, we need to, to realize that, that Jesus is, is worthy of worship. The Bible teaches us that we don't need to, to make images to worship. But we get caught up. We get caught up in the world. We get caught up with having all these things, and, you know, our jobs can can even become idols, our families, 
or pride, all kind of things. You know what they are. These things, anything that comes between you and God, anything that keeps you from worshiping him like you should, needs to be cast aside this morning. Our resurrected Jesus is worthy to be worshiped. They said, come and see. And then they said, go and tell. Matthew 28, 19, and 20, we've all heard this. This is the Great Commission. This is not just for those disciples. This is for us. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Folks, Jesus is... Jesus is in this place this morning. Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the life this morning. I pray this morning if God's putting any kind of a decision on your heart or uh, maybe some decision you have to make, whatever it is, I pray you'll respond to God. And we'll give him the glory for that. It doesn't matter this morning whether you're a a member here, a visitor here, a child of God or not a child of God, whatever God puts on your heart, you respond to him this morning. But especially for those this morning that maybe you've never said yes to Jesus. Again, I walked an aisle much like this one when I was eight years old. Told folks that I got saved, got dunked in the water. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't confused. I knew that I wasn't saved. Praise God at age 25, God had not given up on me. On October 11, 1996, God gave me another opportunity. I don't know how many more after that he might have given me. This morning, God's given you an opportunity. If you don't know Jesus as Lord of your life, it doesn't matter this morning if you're eight years old or you're 80 years old. I pray that you respond to Jesus this morning.